Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, I must apologize that Ray indicated I do have a bit of a cold, just getting over it from, from last week. Uh, so if I have to stop and take a sip of a Buckley's mixture in the middle, please forgive me. It uh, might be what is needed to, uh, to uh, wet the throat and uh, so we can get through this. So the importance of this topic is really um, very, very, very great and it really cannot in some ways be overemphasized. Um, and it's yet on the other hand, it's really rather sad that the basic gospel message has been modified quite extensively over time, and last week we looked at one of the fundamental doctrines relating to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and seen how that was modified. And it's, it's been able to, that the, the uh, traditional understanding of the Trinity has been solidified in the minds of most people, as defined in that particular decree that we talked about, that was made some three three hundred odd years after, formulated four hundred years after the birth of Christ. And this topic of um, what happens with um, life after death is something all of us are interested in because I think it will be true to say that all of us would like to live forever if we are in good health and have a good quality of life. And this question of what happens after death is so therefore of great interest. And it's a topic of interest to people of many different religions, different nations, and there's a wide variety of views on what will happen and um, many, many people assume that a good person will go to heaven or some kind of place of bliss in some way or other. Uh, as we know from, um, uh, from, uh, from what we hear in the media about the Islamist and the, uh, um, the Islamist initiatives, um, those who are suicide bombers immediately go to a place of bliss to enjoy all the pleasures of um, uh, really quite, quite sensuous pleasures really for, for an eternity. And even in the Christian context, uh, many assume that a, a good person will indeed go to heaven. But the question is, how do we know um, that we will do that? I suppose to start with is when we ask the question, how do I know, we can come up with a variety of answers. First of all, uh, if we go back a long time, it's because Greek philosophers told us we will. People like Plato, Socrates and others had an idea that um, the life we live now is just a temporary one, and that man is really properly a, a soul, some abstract kind of uh, influence or intelligence that existed, and that the soul existed before the birth of the body. In other words, a person has always existed in, well, from time immemorial, and will continue to, to exist um, even after they are dead. And that really the soul is, is united with the body, and their perspective was that it was the body is something that is evil, something that is prone to, to wrongdoing, and that at death the soul is going to be free and it will go to a place of great blessing. And that, so that was the, the ideas of Greek philosophers somewhat um, 2,500 years ago. But of course, it didn't originate with them, it actually goes back much earlier. But it's also very interesting that we, we have a positive answer to this question because different church leaders say we will. So, for example, let me give you this quotation. I am now an immortal spirit, strangely commingled with a little portion of earth. In a short time, I am to quit this tenement of clay and remove into another state. So said John Wesley in some of his sermons um, back in the 18th century. Again, um, uh, other leaders have this to say, that the Bible teaches whether we are saved or lost, there is a conscious and everlasting existence in the soul and the personality. So says the still living, um, long life Billy Graham in his book, Peace and God. So that's another Christian perspective. But then people will say, well, of course, I know I'll go to heaven when I die because the Bible says we will. And they go to this quotation in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, that says, where Jesus is speaking just before his death, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. So that is a key, one of the key passages um, that people will, will resort to 
uh, in order to be uh, up, build up their conviction that um, there is a place for them in heaven. Well, <coughs> also, there's other passages that people would go to. For example, this one, that the thief on the cross says to Jesus, remember me when you come in your, into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, truly, I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. So when we look at those three aspects, Greek philosophers, church leaders, and uh, what is asserted that the Bible says will happen to us at death, there seems to be a positive answer to this question about will we go to heaven when we die. But we have to ask the question, is answering this question that simple? You see, there are many different views of what happens at death and of what death is. Some will say that we all immediately go to be judged. And as already indicated, some will say we immediately go to heaven if we are good. Others will say that we immediately go to hell. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the course of the next few minutes. Others would suggest that we are reincarnated into another being. And according to the quality of our life as a person, we will be reincarnated either into somebody better or somebody worse than we are now. Others would suggest that <coughs> death is the end of everything. There is, um, there's, there's simply nothing beyond this. And interestingly enough, in the days when Jesus of Nazareth was in his ministry, there was a group of leaders, religious leaders, who had exactly this view. They were called the Sadducees, and their view was that death ended everything, and that any sense of continuing life was in succeeding generations and in, in, in the generations of their children and grandchildren. Then, of course, there are those who say it's a mystery. We just don't know what happens. And then there are others who would say and, uh, that death is asleep and that resurrection is the, is the life after death. And just to lay the, the groundwork, uh, we would suggest and strongly and demonstrate to you this evening, we hope, the death is indeed asleep, and that this resurrection is the life after death that the scriptures are talking about. <coughs> so we have some fundamental questions. Why are there such differences of opinion, <coughs> even between Christians? The ones who say, yes, we go to heaven. There are other Christians who say, well, no, we go to purgatory. And there is also the other idea that we go to limbo. And this was a Roman Catholic teaching for hundreds and hundreds of years, but it's now been abandoned. It was the place that young children went to if they died uh, before they could be um, brought into the church through the blessing of a priest. But as I say, that idea has now been largely abandoned. Then there is the point that we were making just a few minutes ago that death is asleep until a resurrection. So we have to ask ourselves the question, then what exactly does the Bible say about people, about mankind? And exactly what does the Bible say about life and death? So laying this groundwork, we have set before us a, a, a desire to get a clarification from a biblical perspective of this topic of life after death. And try to answer the question of, well, what does the Bible say about us as people? And what does it say about life after death? Well, in the beginning, uh, the Lord formed man out of the dust of the ground. We talked a little bit about this last week. And that man <coughs> was a lifeless body after he was formed. And in fact, it wasn't until the breath of, was breathed into his nostrils, the breath of life, that he actually became a living soul. So this is really quite important because try to visualize in your mind the details that are given to us in the biblical record in the book of Genesis that life of mankind was a specific event. Man was modeled after the character and the pattern, if you like, the image of, the, of, the, of God himself. And yet, he wasn't until he had this breath of life into his nostrils and he became a living soul. So when we compare different Bible translations about man became a living soul, which is what we have in the King James, 
we have in the NIV and the NASB that man became a living being. And in the uh, living, uh, living Bible, man became a living person. So this, uh, this immediately raises the question that before the breath of life came into the nostrils of the man, what was he? Well, he was not a living soul. He must have been a dead soul, an inanimate soul, certainly in the form of a, of a, of a, of a man. But we would look at, if we looked at Adam before he actually had the breath of life in his nostrils, we would just simply say he was a corpse. So he was not a living being, and he was not a living person. So that really is important for us to appreciate, that, <coughs> that, there, that um, Adam was originally formed out of the dust of the ground, and it wasn't until his breath of life, his ability to breathe, which of course is what we all have and are blessed with, that he became a living person. So let's take another example about uh, this, this theme. David in Psalm, no, Psalm 40 mentions this concerning those who were his enemies at the time he was running away from Saul and others. He speaks of them, those that seek after my soul to destroy it. Or as it's put in the NASB, they seek my life to destroy it. Or in the Living Bible, they seek to snatch away my life. So we can see here the link again between the word life and the word soul. <coughs> Let's look at another biblical example along the same lines in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, where God declares that all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Again, if you look at this from the uh, New American Bible, it translates that verse as all lives are mine. The life of the Father is like the life of the Son. Both are mine, and only the one who sins shall die. So very clearly there's this relationship between living people and souls. And God is declaring that the life of all people is in his hands. And as <clears throat> Job says, if God were to take away his breath, take it back to himself, all of flesh would die. And that breath is indeed the, um, what is generally termed, it's in terms of a very general sense, the spirit of God, which we talked about last week and we'll talk about it again, I believe, next week. So there's this relationship between the life of a person and the soul of a person and being in the hands of the Almighty. And, and God is able to terminate the life of a person. So let's take another look uh, at another example, and this is from Israel's history about, about the king of Assyria. And Assyria was an ancient enemy of Israel. Now, this, the region of Assyria, it's in the Middle East, the northeast of Israel, and we really correspond to the area of Iraq today. In the area between the two great rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, uh, there were famous cities there like Nineveh and, and, and cities like that. And the king of Assyria came, to, uh, came against Israel uh, to, in, in, as really as part of its a plan of, well, conquest of the Middle East. And this is what the prophet Isaiah says, that God will destroy the glory of his forest and his fruit, of his fruitful garden, a figure for the, of speech for the army of the king of Assyria, both soul and body, and it will be as when a sick man wastes away. So again, we see this emphasis that the life of a person, the soul of a person, the being of a person is in the hands of the Almighty. So let's just take a quick look at what we've considered so far. All these, Greek philosophy, church leaders, and we question some Bible passages, support the idea of heaven going. But, and this is where their big but is to be found, is in the Bible, uh, in the Bible, the soul represents human life, but the soul is never identified as a separate part of a person. 
A soul can be alive and living. A soul can be destroyed. A soul can be dead. But interestingly enough, the soul is never said to be undying or immortal or live forever. And this is a very important point to appreciate when we look at uh, the comments of people who would assure us, oh yes, if you live a good life, you will certainly um, have the benefit of uh, bliss in heaven or bliss beyond the skies, as is commonly taken and understood. We need to step back and just ask our session, ourselves the question, what is this soul that the Bible is talking about? <coughs> well, in the Hebrew Old Testament, the, Greek, the Hebrew word is nephesh, and literally it means self or life or person or heart, and it refers to the essence of life and the act of breathing or taking breath, which ties in with some of the things we've already said and commented on last last week. In the New Testament, it really isn't different. It simply means the soul or the life of a person. But interestingly enough, it's also translated as heart in Ephesians chapter 6 and as heartily uh, in Colossians chapter 3. And this is in, re in relation to serving God and helping others. And we get the idea perhaps here that we do so, a person does something with all his heart or with all her heart. And what it means is that they put their energy into it, their whole being into something. And interestingly enough, this word suki, uh, as the Greek word is, which means soul or life, means that somebody puts their whole life into something. There's also this idea of spirit that goes on, because there is this idea that the spirit somehow continues to live on after death. <coughs> well, in the Old Testament, the word for spirit is ruach, and it means breath or air. And it means strength or wind, even breeze, spirit or courage, uh, temper or, or spirit. So you have a variety of meanings in terms of, uh, of spirit. And we, re, we, are, we often speak about somebody who's got a courageous spirit or something like that. And um, we, we know what is meant by that phrase. And in the, the New Testament is the word pneuma, uh, which we commented on last week, which means spirit, and it also denotes as breath, from which we get our English word pneumatic. And interestingly enough, it's frequently translated as ghost in the King James Version. And the reason for this is because when King James men translated the Bible more than 400 years ago, the word ghost had a different meaning uh, from what we use. We have a rather exclusive meaning today, meaning something that's a sort of a phantom that, that, that uh, people supposedly see. But in the days of King James's men, it certainly had the idea of spirit in the sense of mind or purpose or something like that. <coughs> so then, we see then that the idea of soul and spirit in the Bible um, is very basic. And as we mentioned, the idea of soul being something that is perpetual and undying is just absent from the scriptures. So we might ask the question then, where did the idea of the immortal soul come from? Well, it goes back a long, long way. And I think perhaps even in our own experience, if somebody is very close to us, and they're suddenly taken from us in death, there's this immediate feeling that they're still there. Somehow they haven't gone, somehow they were there somewhere because of our sense of relationship to them. And this, this applies to relationships with people. It even applies to relationships that people have with their own pets, that, that, that a pet animal will suddenly die. And there's this feeling in the mind of the person that, well, that animal, that pet that I love so much is somewhere. But <coughs> so, so this idea then of, 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 of something that continues in, that exists, very much exists in the minds of people who are still living. So let's, uh, let's consider some of the writings and comments of people over the course of fairly recent history about this idea of the immortal soul. And I'm going to read uh, an extract from for you. Another consideration of the highest importance is the, that the natural immortality of the soul is a doctrine wholly unknown to the Holy Scriptures and standing on no higher plane than that of an ingeniously sustained, 
but gravely and formidably contested philosophical opinion. And surely there is nothing, uh, there is nothing as to which we ought to be more on our guard than the entrance into the precinct of Christian doctrine, either without authority or by an abuse of authority of philosophical speculation disguised as truth of divine revelation. We have ample warrant for declining to accept the tenet of a natural immortality as a truth of divine revelation. And this is a quotation from a book called Hades, or the Intermediate State by a canon constable, who was a canon of the Church of England in Dublin in the 1860s, 1870s. And this man is, um, did a great deal of study of this topic of um, the immortality of the soul and wrote this book entitled Hades or the Intermediate State of Man. And I think, it's, as you can see, it's a fairly... It, although it was published in the 19th century, it still is available. It's been reprinted now, and I think it is available on public on sites like Amazon or, or chapters or somewhere like that. <coughs> now, let's go back to a point we made last week, because this idea of the immortality of the soul is very widely accepted, and it is very deep-rooted in people's convictions. You may recall, if you were here last week, that we had this um, on the screen. We quoted this. It is widely acknowledged that we tend to find in Scripture what we have conceived as already being there, since none of us can easily face the threatening possibility that our received understanding does not coincide with the Bible. The problem is confounded if we are involved in teaching or preaching the Bible. A religious doctrine which has been accepted intellectually and emotionally is dislodged with great difficulty, as said by Buzzard and Hunting in this book on the doctrine of the Trinity. And you may recall we quoted that last week. But this same principle applies to uh, many aspects of Bible study where a person will get a fixation on an idea, and we're talking tonight, tonight about the immortality of the soul, and see it in different biblical passages, such as the ones we've looked at in Luke and in John 14, and are convinced that that is the case. And I'll just give you a personal, uh, a personal experience. Many, many years ago, I worked with a colleague who didn't have any particular biblical belief, and, and we got in, involved in some, a lot of Bible discussion. He was very, very interested and in fact, in due course after our discussions, he was baptized and got married, and sadly he is now deceased. But I remember visiting his parents, who lived not a far distant, not very far from where I lived, and we had a discussion about their sons, and they only had one one son, their son's baptism, and some of the things related to the fundamental aspects of doc of the of the gospel, and one of them being the kingdom of God. And his mother, Roy's mother. Uh, told me she her, her understanding of life after death was rooted in John chapter 14 and that Jesus was going to go to heaven to prepare a place for us and I don't want you to tell and I'm just about quoting her words I don't want you to tell me anything that will cause me to question that or change my mind because this is an exact example of this quotation we've made here from buzzard and hunting concerning a deep uh, conviction that people have had Again, let's take a look at another quotation. Many people today, even Christian believing people, are far from understanding the basis of their faith. Quite unwittingly, they depend upon the philosophy of the Greeks rather than upon the word of God for an understanding of the world they live in. An insistence of this prevailing belief among Christians is in the immortality of the soul. There is one thing sure we can say at this point, and that is that the popular doctrine of the soul's immortality cannot be tra traced back to the biblical teaching. We discover that the doctrine of the immortality of the soul is omitted in the law of Moses, that's the first five books of the Bible. The Sadducees piously rejected it, and I mentioned that a few minutes, a little while ago, in the context of the uh, Sadducees' belief that death ends everything. The Sadducees piously rejected the immortality of a soul as an opinion that received no countenance from the divine book, 
And the authority of the scriptures, the Pharisees added that of tradition, and that the immortality of the soul became the prevailing sentiment of the synagogue. And this observation is made not by a person who had deep Christian beliefs, but rather by Edward Gibbon in his book, famous book, The Decline uh, and Fall of the Roman Empire. And what Gibbon was gleaning from the historical evidence were the points we just quoted about the view of the of, of people in terms of life after death. So then we need to ask ourselves the question, is the acceptance of human philosophy and tradition surprising? Well, let's take a look at this quotation from the Apostle Paul when he wrote to Timothy at, toward the end of his life, within probably a month or two of his, of his death when he was in prison awaiting trial at the hand of Nero. The time will come, said Paul, when they, that is Christians, will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their hearts from the truth, and turn aside to myths. That's a really very striking observation and uh, really prophetic expectation of what was going to happen and <clears throat> when you look at what's happened in the course of Christian history that's exactly what has happened in relation to this particular topic of life after death and I mentioned a few minutes ago that when we suddenly lose a loved one there's this sense within those of us who are living that somehow they are still there there's an, and there even there are people, of course, as we well know, the spiritists, spiritualists, who think they can communicate with those who are dead. And this idea of wanting of, of I wanting to have teachers who can say the things we want them to say is 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 not um, is not uh, un, unusual. Uh, we might we might uh, we, we might uh, put it this way to uh, allude to Al Gore's famous phrase. People prefer a, a convenient myth to an inconvenient truth or a, a convenient lie to an inconvenient truth. So <clears throat> this is, this is not, not particularly surprising in this context. But let's have a look at those difficult passages. John 14, one, verses 1 and 2 that we looked at before. Do, do these verses really say that we go to heaven when we die to be with Jesus up there? Let's look at some more points, particularly about this verse, and look at it fairly, fairly carefully. First of all, Jesus speaks about God's house. Well, in the New Testament, God's house is a term for believers, the Christians. It never refers to heaven. And Jesus was going to go to heaven to prepare a place for the believer, and that he would return and then he would gather the believers together and he would be with them. Now let's think about the work that Jesus was going to go and do in relation to God's house. What he did a few days after these words were spoken, well, in fact, no, really less than that. Um, it was within 24 hours of when these words were spoken. Jesus was crucified. He was crucified as the Son of God and the Son of Man. He was crucified as a man who had human nature, but who had never committed any transgression or sin. And in himself, he conquered the natural impulse that all of us have and succumbed to the impulse to do what is wrong. <coughs> and by faith in what he accomplished, we can receive the blessing of the hope of eternal life. And the work that Jesus did on the cross was to prepare the place in God's house, which is among which is among the believers, that those who believe on him and have faith in him would be in that house. So we find then that John 14 verses 1 to 2 really don't, aren't as strong as most people would traditionally take. Let's think about this other passage in Luke chapter 23. The thief was saying, Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Now what was it that the thief was focusing on? Well, he was focusing upon Jesus' kingdom. 
he obviously knew that the kingdom that Jesus was established wasn't going to happen at that particular day. He spoke about Jesus coming into his kingdom. And when will Jesus come into his kingdom? Well, it'll be when he returns to the earth. He didn't enter that kingdom on the day on which Jesus said these things. So again, this, this is important that we try to analyze and carefully read what the scriptures are telling us rather than jump to a conclusion that really many, many people do come to and often without giving it too much thought. Why? Because perhaps a church leader or a church minister has told them this. <coughs> Excuse me. And they're quite prepared to accept the comment of their leader or their pastor or their priest. But we need to ask the question, where did Jesus go on that day? Well, he was buried in a tomb. The tomb was in a garden. And that paradise was a Persian word that was brought into the Greek language. And it simply means a garden or an arboretum, a garden of trees. So again, in these verses, there's no suggestion that Jesus went to heaven or some other place of delight. This is important to appreciate that Jesus went to the grave and that he did not go to some place of bliss or anything like that. So then, where did Jesus go on that day? Let's go to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. This is the Apostle Peter speaking on the day of Pentecost. The Apostles had just received the gift of the Holy Spirit for the purpose of being a witness of the resurrection of Christ, proclaiming the gospel, and preaching baptism and forgiveness of sins and the coming kingdom of God. And Peter says concerning King David that he was a prophet, and knowing that God who had sworn to him with an oath to him, that is David, that of the fruit of his loins, that is of his own descendants, according to his to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, that's David's throne. He seeing this, that is David seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. So Jesus, the, the interesting thing here is that the Apostle Peter is actually quoting from Psalm number 16, when he's quoting the words of David, saying that his, so the soul of the Messiah would not be left in hell and his flesh would not see corruption. <coughs> and we know that Jesus was buried that day, as we observe, and that three days later, he actually came out of the tomb. But let's take a look at this word, hell. The Hebrew word is sheol, and literally it means a place of the dead. And in the Greek, it means, the word is Gehenna, and it represents the Hebrew word Gehinnom, now, Gehinnom was the Valley of Hinnom, which was just outside Jerusalem, where all the garbage of the city was burnt. And it was a fire that never went out, and it denoted total destruction. And if you'd like to just go to the Gospel of Mark, if you have a Bible, go to the Gospel of Mark, um, chapter 9, and we'll just have a look at these verses here that Jesus is speaking about. Um, in relation to hell. We'll pick up the record. We've got it at verse 43, where Jesus says, If your hand offends you, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands that go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. And the same thing is said of the foot in verse 45 and the eye in verse 47. And Jesus, of course, is not he's speaking in a, in a figuratively about the, the foot uh, the, the hand, the, the, the foot, and, and the eye. But he's speaking here about fires that cannot be quenched, and this word Gehenna is related to this place where the garbage was burnt and it never went out. And perhaps on another occasion we talk about other parts of the scriptures that speak about fires that will never be extinguished, um, the, um, that in fact obviously did go out um, in the historical record of the, of the history of Israel. Now let's have a look at another word <coughs> that is used in the New Testament, and it's the word Hades. 
Uh, Hades, interestingly enough, if you look in a concordance, they'll tell you that it's the Greek, the region of departed spirits of the lost. Now that was the Greek idea of the time, and as we've, as even as I've already presented, it was a common idea among the Greeks that the spirits or the souls lived on in a variety of ways, and this was the meaning of this. The idea of Hades was this place where these departed spirits of were, 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 were actually went. But what's particularly interesting is that in the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint which is denoted by LXX, which is Roman numerals for 70, because that's the number of scholars that translated from Hebrew to Greek about 250 BC. Hades is the equivalent of the Greek word Sheol. That's why Peter spoke about thou wilt not leave soul, his soul in Hades or hell, which is, which is precisely the same meaning that we have in Acts in um, Psalm 16, where the original word is Sheol, which was the place of the dead. Again, we read of the same phrase in, in, um, in um, <coughs> 1 Corinthians 15, where in fact, if you take a quick look at 1 Corinthians 15, we just got to want to reverse, look at verse 55 here. Because this is a chapter where the Apostle Paul is emphasizing the importance of the resurrection. And he speaks about death being asleep, which we'll talk about again in a minute. And he speaks about a resurrection. And he then goes on in relation to the final fulfillment of God's purpose. He says that death is swallowed up in victory at the end of verse 54. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And what the Apostle Paul is quoting is from he, Hosea chapter 13, verse 14. And in, the, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse um, verse 55, grave is the original word Hades, but in Hebrew it's Sheol, simply the place of the dead. So although the Greeks had the idea that Hades was the place of departed spirits, Peter used the phrase in relation to Sheol as the place of the dead and not to prove that Jesus' soul was living in some other state while he was dead. Also, think about this. If Jesus, when he was unquote unquote dead, was in some other state, what was the point of the resurrection? And this will be a true thing to consider in relation to all Christians or believers. If in fact we do die and we go to a place of bliss, then what's the purpose of a bodily resurrection which is spoken about so strongly in 1 Corinthians 15? There seems to be no purpose of this. But anyway, we must pass on. So we must ask ourselves the question, what about death? Well, what do the living know about death? Well, to be perfectly honest, it's really a guess in terms of people speaking about, well, my loved one is still living somewhere or something like that. And <clears throat> what do the dead know about being alive? Well, this is an important question because we want to go to and have a look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Now, Ecclesiastes is just after that big book of Psalms. We want to go to chapter 9 and look up a few verses here because it really does give us a good perspective and a good summary of how the, those, those who are living uh, relate to death and what death really is. It's Ecclesiastes chapter 9, and we're going to look at verse 5. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished, neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Now, go down to verse 10. Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. There is no work, no device, no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave where you are going. So we see this summary that we're given here in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 explains that when we are dead, we know nothing, we have no consciousness, <coughs> we cannot commit any more sins, we cannot do any more good, we cannot do any more evil. And therefore, because of that, we should put all our energy into, 
into things that are worthwhile while we are living. So the, the Bible gives us, as I hinted already, and that death is an analogy of sleep. And Jesus had a great friend by the name of Lazarus. We read about him and his death in John chapter 11. When Jesus hears that Lazarus is a very sick man, he says to his disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. You can see that the Lord Jesus here is very clearly equating this death state to being asleep. And of course, when we are asleep, we have no awareness, except of course, while we're a, as, a, as a living person, we do have our own dreams. <clears throat> but typically we have no knowledge of what goes on in the world while we're asleep. We may go to bed at 10 or 11 at night and wake up eight hours later, and the world might be a different place um, after we wake up. We know nothing of what has gone on in the world around us. So then, coming to the question, how do I know I'll go to heaven when we die? We need to look at these points. Based upon the biblical evidence, there is no ground for believing this. Death, in fact, is the opposite of life. It is asleep. So then the inevitable question is, well, all right, then what? Jesus is the model. In Acts chapter 3, I'm sorry, that's a typo. It should be Acts chapter 2. Jesus' soul was not left in hell or in the grave. He was raised from the dead. His body and his personality and his whole person came out of the grave and was reconstituted into the man he was. And that Jesus was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised Jesus to life. Again, in, we looked at 1 Corinthians 55. Through Jesus' resurrection, there is a victory over the grave. So from the point of view of the Apostle Paul, he writes in these words in 1 Corinthians 15, when he speaks, What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, if the dead rise not? Now, just a brief word about beasts. When he was in the city of Ephesus, he received a great deal of support. Many, many converted to the Christian faith, but a huge amount of opposition. And in fact, that opposition was in the form of, of riots. <coughs> Those in senior positions of authority could oppose him, and he likens them to beasts. And, the, and he's just saying, look, all this turmoil that I went through, what's the point of it if the dead are not raised? So he immediately asked the question, if Billy Graham, John Wesley, and the others are right, and believers go to heaven when they die, this person does this, this verse doesn't make any sense. Because if Billy Graham, John Wesley, and many, many others are right, then if Paul had died in Ephesus as a devout Christian believer, he would have immediately gone to heaven and enjoyed the joys of everlasting life up there. But he doesn't. He's relating his difficulties to the resurrection. As I say, they, 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 their comment makes no sense if indeed we go to heaven. It's only the resurrection that makes Paul's endurance of opposition worthwhile. So he says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die again, quoting from 1 Corinthians 15, this great chapter on the resurrection. So what Paul is saying is that without a resurrection, there is no hope. We might as well simply enjoy ourselves in, in human pleasure. A bit like the, the Sadducees of Jesus' day, who were so convinced that death ends, in every, the death ends everything, and that the only form of immortality was in succeeding generations, they had this sort of facility of, of, um, of uh, enjoying themselves, and that's why they became an extremely wealthy group of people in Israel in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Paul goes on and he says, if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, you are still in your sins, 
then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ, notice the reference to sleep in Christ, have perished. So what are the major implications if there's no resurrection? There's significant, there's significant says Paul. Christ was not raised from the dead. And the resurrected Christ is presented as being the basis and the hope of Christianity. In fact, the resurrection of Christ is the <coughs> cornerstone of Christianity. It's unique among religions of the world inasmuch as it's based upon a reasonably provable historical fact, and not the ideas and philosophies of one person. So if there is no resurrection, then the hope of Christianity is false. There is no forgiveness of sins, and those who died believing in a resurrection died in a false hope. And those being who died believing in a false hope are doomed to remain in the grave for eternity. So again, we ask the question, how do I know I'll go to heaven when I die? Well, the assurance of the Greek philosophers is of no value. The assurance of church leaders is of no value. They've incorporated the ideas of Plato and others into their theology. Believing to going to heaven is, when I die is, is a false hope. It's tragic. It's a misunderstanding of scripture. So what is the answer to the question of life after death? Well, if Paul gives it to us in this great chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. Christ uh, has been raised from the dead and is a first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits afterwards those that are coming now paul likens the resurrection of christ to being a first fruit it's like it's like it's like any harvest if you've got say an apple tree and there's always one of the apples ripens first you pick it you taste it and you like it and it's an indicator of what the harvest is going to be like <coughs> so jesus christ in his resurrection was like the first fruits and at his coming there's going to be a harvest. There's going to be an ingathering of all those who are in Christ. Now, what a, uh, make an observation as well. Everybody is in Adam, so all of us will die. And those who are in Christ will be made alive. And if people are in Christ by choice. It's a matter of choice that, where people will accept Christianity, the Christian faith, or they will reject it. It's according to their own choice. But we have this distinction between the two but all those who are in Adam will die, and those in Christ will be, will, will, will be made alive, but this, it is a matter of choice whether we will be in Christ. So what is the conclusion that we can come to? Well, the Bible teaches us that there is life after death, but what the Bible does not teach is that there is life during death. And if you think about those two statements, there's a significant difference. The life after death is resurrection. During death, there is a sleep. And when Jesus returns to the earth, there will be a resurrection and a gift of eternal life for believers. And this theme is the consistent message of the entire Bible from beginning to end. So <clears throat> what about those church leaders is what they are saying consistent with the bible or have they been following greek philosophy rather than god the, the word of god have they been resting scripture and creating misunderstanding for themselves and others and this is a tragic story because it really does appear that this for many many years hundreds of years this has been the message that has been given to people that when we die, we will go to be with Christ in some place of bliss, and yet that is not the scriptural message. People have been misled, sadly, into this misunderstanding. So it's really a matter of choice. And we come back to the point we made last week about being a careful reader of these Bible texts in the context of the entire Bible, being a diligent Bible student and using study helps like concordances, lexicons, and, and other study writings, and having integrity to the message of the Bible. 
to accept that the Bible may say things we are not inclined to accept. And this is challenging, as we, as we observed earlier in that quotation from Hunting uh, Buzzard and Hunting. And so this is our challenge. So we now come to the time of questions. Do anybody, does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask? And bearing in mind, we really we have certainly not exhausted this topic or looked at all the um, all the possible passages or points that can be made. <coughs> Question about um, the verse that was brought up in Luke, the thief, um, verse 20, uh, chapter 23, verse 23. It's the, let's see, is the comma in there in the original Greek? Because I think that can lead to differences in interpretation of where that comma actually is. If it is You're looking at where? Uh, Luke 23, 43. Oh, okay. Sorry, I was in the wrong place. Luke twenty-three forty-three. Okay. Yes. Okay. So your question is about the um, about the uh, verily I say unto thee, today thou shalt be in paradise. <coughs> the significance of that comma. Yes, because if that do you know if that's in the original Greek? Because if it comes before today, I can see how people would think that okay, today you're coming into paradise, or today you're coming into heaven. If it's coming after it, it can just be a kind of time. I'm, I'm telling this today. It's not there at all, but I can see how. Sure. Okay. Yes. The, interestingly enough, in the original Greek, there was no punctuation at all. Um, everything just went on, ran on sentences. In fact, if you look at Greek, there weren't even spaces between the words. So this comma was not there, and it was King James's men and others who, did, who decided to put the comma there. But one could he just as easily read the verse as Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto thee today, thou shalt be with in paradise. And that does change the emphasis. Um, <clears throat> but people might sort of quibble about the argument and say, the, the, the comma, and say it is very important. Um, and in their minds, yes, Jesus was indicating that the thief was going to be with him in paradise that day. But as we mentioned earlier on, that the idea of where, where Jesus went that day was not to be in paradise. His body was put in the grave. And in fact, his soul was in hell, as we quoted, as Peter quoted from uh, Psalm, Psalm 16. Does, does that help? Yes, thank you. Any other questions, Lord? <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, did you have a question? No, no, my question. We're fine. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks. Well, if there's no more questions, Martin, if you want to close the prayer, then we'll let you go take care of your cold. <laughs> okay, thanks. Let's just uh, bow our heads. Oh, Lord God Almighty in heaven above. How well blessed we are in this, in our countries. The freedom to open the scriptures and discuss them. And we prayed, good Father, that we'd be strengthened and encouraged to appreciate the wonder of the resurrection by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that the great promise of life after death is in the coming kingdom that the Lord Jesus will establish. Help us to understand this and appreciate these things and think about these things in the week to come. And help us to consider the scriptures and relate us to this great promise, this great hope, the hope of Israel, that we might live for the glory of your name in all that we do. In the name of Jesus Christ, we give thanks now and seek this blessing. Amen. All right, Martin. Well, thank you again. And we hope you feel better. <coughs> I hope so too. Lord willing, Lord willing, we will see you in one week. Lord willing, yes, indeed. That's right. Take care. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.